make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and the function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Uh, you might have to loosen the sides to flip that. I forgot where I was. Uh, yeah, thank you. The primary constitutional objectives and aims of this class are as follows. First, to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men whereby man must be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace. Our slogan is speak the truth. At this time, we will have a prayer by Dr. Janice Welsh. Our scripture for this evening is Genesis, the 20th chapter, to be read by Dr. Deborah Laraway. And I will be doing the announcements at the end of class. Good evening, class. Let's all bow our hearts and minds and thank Yahshua for this glorious gift that he's given us. We ask that you open our hearts, open our minds, and give us an even better understanding. And we appreciate all the things that you have taught us so far about you and your kingdom and your salvation. And with those words, let us all say hallelujah. hallelujah. Good evening. I'll be reading out of the Holy Name Bible containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with the ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by the late AP Training of the Scripture Research, so Research Association Incorporated, reprinted by Yahshua Promotions. Genesis, the 20th chapter. 
And Moses journeyed from thence towards the south country and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur, and sojourned to Gyar. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister, and Amalek the king of Gerar sent and took Sarah. But Elohim came to Amalek in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art a dead man because of the woman which thou hast taken, for she is married to a husband. But Amalek had, had, Amalek had not come near her, and he said to him, Wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Say he not unto me, she is my sister. And she even, she herself said, he is my brother. In the sincerity of my heart and innocency of, of my hands have I done this. And Elohim said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that you dis, thou didst this in the, in the integrity of thy heart. For I also would help thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffer I thee not to touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know that, that, know that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Therefore Ambalek, Ambalek rose early in the morning and caused all his servants and told, called all his servants and told these things in their ears, and the men were sore afraid. Then Ambalek and called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I offered thee that thou what have oh sorry, and what have I offended thee that thou hast brought on me and in my kingdom a great sin, that that and thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done? And Amalek said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that that thou hast done this thing. And Abraham said, Because I surely the fear of Elohim is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet indeed she is my sister. She is, my, she is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to pass when Elohim caused me to wander from, wander from my father's house, that I said unto her, This is this is thy kindness, which thou shalt show unto me at every place, whither we shall come. Say of me, he is my brother. And Amalek took the sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored Sarah, his wife. And Amalek said, Behold, my, hand, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleaseth thee. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I gave thee thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering covering of the eyes and unto all that are with thee and with all other thus she was reproved so abraham prayed unto elohim and elohim healed Amalek and his wife and his maidservants and they bare children for yahweh had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Amalek because of sarah's sarah abraham's wife that was genesis the 20th chapter Good evening, class. I would like to remind everyone at this time to please quiet all cell phones and electronic devices so our class is not disturbed. Choir.
secret chord, a pleasing sound and a single word revealed to us from heaven as Yahshua. With the Holy Spirit teaching you, the law, the prophets, I'll show you fulfillment of the scriptures is Yahshua. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hell gave us a way to know the truth, his purpose pattern and plan our proof principles of blood water and spirit repeating throughout history unveiling his light from mystery songs of angelic choir can you hear it testimony I could have been dead and gone but Yahweh let me live on I am a living testimony and I thank Yahweh I'm still alive oh I am a living testimony I could have been dead and gone And Yahweh let me live on I am a living 
living testimony. I thank Yahweh I'm still alive. I've seen miracle after miracle performed all through my life. He kept having mercy on me. I know I didn't deserve to be alive. I faced dangers I couldn't see. Yeah, you had your angels camped around me. Well, I better take the time to say thank you for keeping me alive. Well, I've had many friends and loved ones. They've gone on before me, y'all. You know, it caused my heart to bleed. I know all the time it could have been me. Oh, I'm not worthy, no, no, no. You had your angels camped around me. I thank Yahweh I'm still alive. Sing it with me now. I am a living testimony. I could have been dead and gone. Well, Yahweh let me live on. I am a living testimony. And I thank Yahweh I'm still alive. Well, I've had a miracle after miracle performed all through my life. He kept having mercy on me. You know, I didn't deserve to be alive. I know it. And I faced dangers I couldn't see. Yeah, you had your angels, your angels camped around me. Well, I think I better thank you for keeping me alive. Well, I've had many, many, many friends and loved ones. They've gone on before me, y'all. Well, it caused my heart to bleed. And I know all the time it could have been me. I'm not worthy. No, I'm not worthy. But you had your angels around me. And I thank Yahweh for keeping me alive. Come on, y'all. I am a living testimony. I could have been dead and gone. And Yahweh let me live on. I am a living testimony. And I thank Yahweh I'm still alive. Come on, y'all. Well, I'm still alive. You better thank him. I'm still alive. Thank him every day. I'm still alive. Oh, I thank you, Yahshua. I'm still alive. Oh, I'm still alive. Thank you for teaching me. I'm still alive. You better learn that pattern. I'm still alive. I thank you, Yahshua, I'm still alive. Oh, you better learn his name. Oh, you better learn Yahweh, Elohim, and Yahshua. Well, oh, yeah. Well, I'm still alive. I thank you, Yahshua, I'm still alive. I thank Yahweh, I'm still alive. Oh, yeah. I thank Yahweh, I'm still alive. One more time, y'all. I thank Yahweh, I'm still alive.
out of the way. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, choir. Good evening, class. Our first speaker for this evening will be our, our dean, Dr. Terry Roche. All right. All right. Thank you. <laughs> you can see that on Okay. Nope. It won't. Very good. Thank you. Well, greetings in Yashua. And uh, so we are very blessed to be able to know anything about our Creator Yahweh and His purpose because He's revealed it through the vision that He's given to Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, the same vision that he gave to the first Bible writer, Moses, the last Bible writer, John. And in both cases, with Moses and John, Yahweh Elohim showed them something that Dr. Kinley, <coughs> <coughs> excuse my voice, <coughs> Di <coughs> there we go, drew out, diagrammed out in great detail, and that is this tabernacle pattern, which we're going to be talking about tonight. And the tabernacle pattern, its dimensions, the tabernacle numbers. Um, we don't talk about this a whole lot. Doctors Underwood uh, were doing some things with this on a Zoom class and uh, kind of encouraged me or inspired me to kind of go into it, share it with you here because we haven't done this for a long time. And um, so, let me give everyone just a little, very brief background on why we would even talk about this, okay? Um, first of all, the objective is to learn about Yahshua the Messiah, because without knowing about Yahshua, we cannot have a proper relationship with our Heavenly Father, Yahweh. And in fact, Yahshua was the Creator, Yahweh, manifest in the flesh. He was the Word made flesh, and he said that no man comes unto the Father except by Him. And the Father is not a separate person, but the Father is in fact Him instead of in this kind of material manifestation in His original state, which is a higher state. It is an abstract state, just like water vapor is in a higher energy state and a more abstract state than ice but both are made of the same chemical substance, H2O. Water vapor, liquid water, solid ice are all made of the same thing. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all one and the same Spirit, but simply existing in three distinct states or conditions. And just like you can have a glass of water that is half full of water, has an ice cube in it and a cover over the top, in that glass of water, you'll have the liquid, the ice, and in that other space, you'll have water vapor. So you have all three in that same container, that same system. And so the point is that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are in fact this one spirit existing in three states all together or all at once. And um, so, uh, in order to be able to see the abstract, so to speak, which you can't technically see with your eyes, and, but in order to know anything about it, you look at the things that are uh, touchable, tangible, investigatable, in order to see the things that are more invisible. You know, it's kind of like the scientific method, okay? And Yahweh has given witnesses or manifestations of Himself. He, he, in this spirit embodiment, which is a representation of Him appearing in a spiritual form, but actually He is the embodiment of all that spirit is, 
This was made visible in visions and revelations, and then he manifest in the flesh, Yahshua the son of Nun, being the same individual as Yahshua the Messiah, both cases simply being Yahweh Elohim manifest in the flesh. So people were able to see him in the physical form, see him in a spiritual form, and these are two manifestations of the one invisible Yahweh. Now, when Yahweh gave visions to people like Moses, and this is recorded in the book of Exodus, and he also gave the same vision to the apostle John, that's recorded in the book of Revelation. You go to Revelation, the first chapter, I'm not going to do it tonight, but when you go to Revelation, the first chapter, he describes this tabernacle pattern, and he describes seeing Yahshua in this pattern. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, they're part of the tabernacle pattern, and the other things that are described there show him very much like this or this. This is simply him in what Dr. Kinley, I believe, called his everyday work clothes, and this is him in his garments for glory and beauty. Okay. But it's the same one seen in the beginning and in the ending of his purpose. So, John saw him, Moses saw him. Moses wrote a great deal about this tabernacle pattern. And uh, in fact, there is a total of 50, five zero, not one five, not 15, 50 chapters in the Bible that relate to showing the tabernacle pattern, its dimensions, its operations or services as the priest would perform in the tabernacle and so forth. That's a lot of Bible to be devoted to the tabernacle pattern. And that's because this tabernacle pattern was given as a witness or a manifestation of spiritual things or heavenly things. So I'd like to get a couple of scriptures about that quickly if I could. And then uh, I want to go into the actual numbers, dimensions, and some of the details regarding the service of the tabernacle in terms of what it symbolizes. Because everything that Yahweh had to do here was symbolic or representative of something spiritual. Now, if you would please get for me um, Exodus, the 25th chapter. The um, 8th through the 10th verses, yeah, that would, yeah, even 9 would be adequate, but... Um, and then uh, over on the 40th verse, and then I'd like Hebrews, the 8th chapter and the 5th verse, and then Hebrews, the 9th chapter and the first couple of verses, and that'll be better, that portion will be better out of the King James Bible. Okay? All right. So if you've got those, I'd appreciate it greatly. Exodus 25 and 9. Yes. According to all that I showed thee. Whoops. You want to do eight. it, really? Yes. And, yeah, nine. I did okay. say 8 through 10. Sorry. And yes. let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Okay, this is a record of Yahweh Elohim having Moses in Mount Sinai in a vision for 40 days and nights, telling Moses in this vision to let them, the children of Israel, make for Yahweh Elohim a sanctuary. That's this tabernacle. Please read on. According to all that I showed thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all things, of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. Okay, so when he had Moses to have the children of Israel make this physical tabernacle, it would be uh, exactly according to this pattern that he showed him. Read on, please. Tenth. And they shall make an ark of shittim wood, two cubics and a half the length thereof. Okay, you know what? I'm going to have you pause on that because there's a... Actually, a whole lot that we can get into the detail there, but what I want is primarily at this moment, just the 40th verse, and then over in Hebrews. So the Adam make us a tabernacle here. Go ahead. 40th verse. And look that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. And that tells you right here that it was in Mount Sinai in this vision that Yahweh Elohim showed Moses this tabernacle pattern, which he was going to have Moses may have the children of Israel make a physical tabernacle uh, like that pattern in that he showed in the mount. Hebrews 8, 5, and then 9, the first. Hebrews 8 and 5. 
Yes. Who serve unto the example of, and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of Elohim when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Okay, so this tabernacle and the services in it served as an example and shadow of heavenly things or spiritual things. Okay, and uh, this was made according to the pattern that Yahweh Elohim had shown Moses in the mountain. He said, see, or make sure that you make all things according to the pattern that I showed you there in Mount Sinai. So you read about it in Exodus 25. Now you read about it in Hebrews 1, about this pattern being shown to him in Mount Sinai, pattern of the tabernacle, ninth chapter. Hebrews 9 and 1. Mm -hmm. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Okay, so this was the Old Testament or the Old Covenant that Yahweh Elohim made with the children of Israel when he brought them out of Egypt in the Exodus, brought them to Mount Sinai, and 50 days after he brought them through the Red Sea or out of the land of Egypt, he made a covenant with them, a contract, an agreement, which in essence was really very much a marriage contract. And when he did this, um, uh, well, read it again, and then we'll read on a little bit. 9 and 1, Hebrews. Mm -hmm. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Okay. For there was a tabernacle made. Now, so there was a tabernacle that was made here. Go ahead. The first wherein was the candlestick, and the table, and the shewbread, which is called the sanctuary. Okay, so the holy place, or the sanctuary, that they're describing is the middle of the three compartments of the tabernacle. And in this first compartment, they call it the first because this was the actual courtyard. Okay, and so when you went into the first room of the house, it was a two-room house in a big courtyard. Okay? But there were three distinct areas all total, including the courtyard, which went round about the house or the tabernacle. And so there was the most holy place, holy place, and court round about. So when in, they went into this first room, there was the candlestick or the lampstand, the table of shoe bread, and the altar of incense. In the second compartment, which is the most holy place or the holy of holies, which by the way, we'll run into this other statement at one point, the sanctum of sanctorum, which is simply Latin, meaning holy of holies, okay, or the most holy place. This, and, and the true most holy place or sanctum of sanctorum, in fact, is the body of Yahshua, the Messiah. But in any case, this most holy place here had three vessels made into a single unit. The Ark of the Covenant, uh, which was made uh, in, of three distinct items, then joined together as a single unit, the cherubim of gold, the mercy seat, uh, which, uh, and then the ark, which was the, the chest, okay, which was, ended up being overlaid with gold, and the mercy seat ended up becoming the lid of the ark, and the cherubim were actually put beaten right into the lid or into the mercy seat so that the three items became a single unit. That represents the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in heaven or the most holy place. And then you've got these three here, these three here, and you've got three um, in the court roundabout, which are the, um, the uh, holy anointing oil, which was probably actually in a horn instead of a golden cup like this appears to be. But um, this, it was a cup or a horn of anointing oil that was used, and it was used actually in different places in the tabernacle, but it's shown here over the priest's head because in order for the priest to operate it all in the tabernacle, he had to end up going through a ritual at the beginning uh, of his uh, entire administration and be appointed and anointed. And the way he was anointed was to stand here at the door. We'll talk more about this in a few minutes. And the holy anointing oil would be poured over his head on the turban that he had. It would run down along his beard and the clothing and so forth 
technically he was here at the door. It's drawn here over to the side just so you've got room to paint a drawing. Okay, So this is not intended to be a scale model. I will show you a scale drawing in a few minutes here. Okay, But the priest was anointed with the oil at the door. And so that vessel with oil was a holy anointing oil. It represented the spirit. And then there is the laver of water for washing here and the altar of sacrifice down here. And I'll show you again where they fit in the tabernacle. But there are three vessels here, three vessels here, and three vessels here joined into one. And that makes a total of nine vessels, okay? Three, three, and three, showing that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in fact, are one, and he is complete right within himself, regardless of whether he is in the abstract state, the intermediate state, or the concrete state. He is still the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? Um, but uh, there's different states or conditions in which he exists, just like there's different compartments of the tabernacle. Anyway, you were reading there. Uh, go back to the first verse, and we'll... Kind of Back zoom through one. that. Yeah, just for context. Okay. Hebrews 9 and 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Mm -hmm. For they were for there was a tabernacle made. Mm -hmm. The first, wherein was the candlestick, and the table, and the shoe bread, which was called the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which was called the holiest of all, mm -hmm. which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, mm -hmm. wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. Right. And over it, the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Okay. Now, now that's good enough <clears throat> for now. So I wanted to show you that... Uh, um, this tabernacle pattern is talked about in, like it said in the 8th chapter and the 5th verse, it's a shadow of heavenly things or a symbol of spiritual things. Now, what particular spiritual things are represented here? It's the Creator, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit existing in all three states and conditions. Okay. That's in showing that the tabernacle is in the Bible. Like I said, there's a total of about 50 chapters devoted to the tabernacle and the services, including the priests and the uh, priest garments that he had to use and services that he had to perform. That's a lot of Bible devoted to it. It's very important. <laughs> when I grew up, you know, I guess I heard, well, I know I heard, read, was told in Christianity that there was a tabernacle that the children of Israel had under the Old Testament, but nobody really told me anything about it or even told me that there was anything terribly important about it. More or less, it was just the tent that was for God's presence that had his throne or Ark of the Covenant back there with the children of Israel, primarily during the wilderness of Sinai 40 years that they had, and nobody really told me much more about it than that. But this tabernacle pattern is truly the pattern of heavenly things. It is the key of knowledge, uh, and it was used in the visions that Yahweh Elohim gave to Moses, John, and Dr. Kinley to show the Creator Himself, and how everything that the Creator made was made by Himself or made by this pattern. Okay, and so, um, in fact, let me say this. The tabernacle pattern is one of three absolutely vital, essential doctrinal points that we really need to come to understand and appreciate in order to know the Creator like He really is and actually exists. First name of the school. To help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as He really is and as He actually exists. Not just to have a concept about God that you can uh, idolize or, or think that you are admiring, 
but in fact, to really know and understand your creator so that your relationship with the creator is based on reality, not fantasy. Okay? And the tabernacle pattern is the second of the three main principles. All three of these were shown in visions to Moses. Yahshua himself, when he taught about himself, went back to Moses' writings, and Moses' writings came from these three visions. First was here at the burning bush, where Yahweh Elohim gave Moses his personal proper name. Nobody knew that name beforehand. Yes, in the Bible that talks about people that came before Moses, the name Yahweh is used. It's used there because Moses, after learning the name of the Creator, was shown these people in these visions, and he wrote about them, knowing that it was Yahweh Elohim that had been working with them. But those people did not have the great blessing and privilege of knowing Yahweh Elohim's personal proper name. But his name was actually revealed to Moses here at the burning bush. It's very important, his name. Then the second thing is this tabernacle pattern. When Yahweh Elohim had Moses on Mount Sinai, he had him up here 40 days and 40 nights twice. In that first 40 days and 40 nights, he showed Moses this tabernacle pattern and other things by the pattern for all 40 days and 40 nights. And so the tabernacle pattern was the key. It was the framework within which everything else was viewed in this vision that he showed to Moses up here for 40 days and nights. Now, he took Moses up here the last time, that would be this third great vision I'm referring to, and again he showed Moses everything by the tabernacle pattern, but he also at that point showed Moses how he, Yahweh Elohim the Creator, would, after Moses' time, come in as Yahshua the Messiah and fulfill his own will and his own purpose and would finish the work that he had set up and established when he created everything in heaven and now he's going to come down here and finish the job or finish the work or fulfill his own will which he had recorded in Moses' writings and the prophet's writing which is called the law and the testimony. Okay, So the name, the pattern, and the fulfillment are three vitally, vitally essential things that we need to know doctrinally. But we're going to focus the rest of this evening on this tabernacle pattern and more on the numbers and the dimensions that are involved in it. Now, I think we have on our website some notes that I made for myself years ago. And I've shared these notes as well as some other things that have been uploaded. Dr. Andy Craig uploaded these on the, his Google Drive that is linked or attached in to idmrlansing.com. Uh, uh, and did I say that right? Dot blog. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, you have to use the dot blog to get there. idmrlansing dot blog. And then you go to learn more. There's two buttons. Then one of the buttons says learn more, and it'll connect you over to Dr. Andy Craig's Google Drive where he's uploaded a whole series of things. You've got all kinds of things in there as references, but one of those things is a little document. Uh, well, there's two documents. One is called Tabernacle Dimensions. The other is called the uh, Tabernacle Numbers. And um, uh, the Tabernacle Numbers it was made by myself many years ago as notes to me, just as things to remind me of certain things that would be important about the tabernacle and its numbers. However, and I'm mentioning this because I want you to understand people have gone and got that and you know they tell me, yeah, there's a lot of information there, it's, it's helpful, but then they end up with a lot of questions and that makes perfect sense because it was never written as an explanation of anything. Okay, So what I am in the process of trying to do is get that document rewritten with a little more detail, a little more explanation. It probably won't be, 
I don't want it to become an extensive paper, you know, a long, many-page paper, but I want it to have uh, um, information that anybody can pick up and at least discern what the meaning is on something. All right, so um, we're going to talk about that tonight. That rewrite is not ready yet, uh, but I just want you to know that at some point we will plan on having it. Okay, all right, now... Um, I have a document there that I would like for the reader to read, and I'm going to go over and do something with these numbers and with the tabernacle dimensions. All right, go ahead and start reading, please. Tabernacle numbers. The tabernacle, the sanctuary, the holy place, and the front of the court roundabout are each threefold or divisible in length by the number three. Okay, so let me show you here. I'm going to go from place to place, detail. This is not a scale drawing. I'll bring one out in a minute. The tabernacle, meaning the entire structure, okay? The sanctuary, okay? I'm sorry? Go ahead and read it. Go ahead. The tabernacle. Yeah. The sanctuary. The sanctuary. The holy place. And, the, and this is the holy place, and sometimes... These two rooms together are called the sanctuary. They, they, sometimes these words are used uh, in, with different specific things, yeah, interchangeably. But here we're talking about the two rooms, that I'm calling them the sanctuary. Then there's the holy place, which is this first longer room, bigger room, okay? Go ahead. And the front of the court roundabout. And the front of the, of the courtyard, which is called the court round about the tabernacle are each threefold or divisible in the length by the number three so everything here is divisible equally by the number three and that's showing that three representing the father the son and the holy spirit is the underlying principle for everything because it's this is here to show things about the father the son and the holy spirit so these are divisible by three every single one of them um, I'll get the scale drawing while you continue on. We'll back up and deal in details. Three of 50 feet, three of 15 feet, three of 10 feet, three of 23 feet as fouls. Okay, so we have three sections of, what is that again? 50 feet. 50 feet. Now, this is a scale drawing, okay? Again, Dr. Craig did this. It's a scale drawing of the tabernacle, not a three-dimensional, it's a two-dimensional drawing. This right here is an outline of the entire tabernacle, okay? And the length of this tabernacle, which basically is the uh, there's a word escaping me, I'm sorry. Anyway, this is, beg your pardon? Well, yeah, the, the pillars, bars, and boards, and the hangings that are there uh, go around the entire courtyard, okay? And the length of the courtyard, or, or the court roundabout, the length of it is 100 cubits, or 150 feet, okay? So this is 150 feet in our units, uh, 100 cubits, as it's described in the Bible, a cubit being a foot and a half, okay? 18 inches or a foot and a half, okay? Because a foot is 12 inches, so a foot and a half would be 12 plus half of that, which is 12 plus 6, which is how many? 18. So 18 inches is a foot and a half, which is also a cubit, okay? A foot and a half is a cubit. So 100 cubits or 150 feet for the entire length of the courtyard. All right, um, go ahead and read, please. The tabernacle is 150 feet long and covered compartments holy and most holy together are 45 feet. All right, so this right here that I'm outlining are the compartments that were covered. They had a, a roof, not a hard roof, but it was a covering of skins, okay? And this was, uh, these together were a total of 45 feet in length, okay? 
All right, so you've got 45 feet in length there. You've got 150 feet in length here, okay? And the 150 feet, I'm looking for markers. Oh, it's on the other side. Okay. Let's see if I can lock this down. If it'll allow me. Okay. So the length of the courtyard is 150 feet. If you divide that by three, that equals 50 feet, okay? So you have that having 50 feet. The I'll get to the details in a minute. I'm trying to put this together. And then you had that other section being 45 feet. Divide that by three, and what do you get? 15 feet, okay? And then you had, as a part of that, you have the 30-foot holy place itself, which is divisible by three into three groups of 10 feet. Now, this is your entire sanctuary. It includes the holy place and the most holy place. The holy place and the most holy place. This is 45 feet. So this whole thing is 150 feet. This section is 45 feet. This portion right here is 30 feet. Okay, and so now, um, then what you have also is this front of the court roundabout, the front courtyard, okay, and that ended up being 70 feet, okay, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but 70 feet there, which is not readily divisible by three, there is a principle of where you can divide it by three and you get 23 and one third, which is, again, it's, it's intended by Yahweh as a principle. And that actually shows basically the degree of tilt of the earth on its own axis. Um, but the way this actually worked in terms of divine numerology, which is what we're going to get into, uh, prophecies with the years and so forth, that out of that 70 feet, the priest, when he's anointed, remember I told you he stood right there at the door, and the length of a priest's foot is about one foot. <laughs> so he would take up one foot out of the 70 feet, if he's standing here, okay, and that would leave a total of 69 feet, and you divide that by three, and that equals 23. And of course, you're going to have three sections of 23 feet. And that's going to be from the gate to the altar, 23 feet, from the altar to the labor, 23 feet, from the labor to where the priest stood, 23 feet, and the last foot would be where the priest stood. Okay? And that's displayed here. Okay? So you have from the gate, the entrance into the tabernacle, from there to the altar, 23 feet. And when I say the altar, I mean the center of the altar, would be 23 feet. Then from there to the laver would be another 23 feet. And from the laver to where the priest stood, and you notice this drawing shows the priest standing there at the door. Okay? So that would be another 23 feet, and then the priest would take up that last one foot. Okay? All right. And then this holy place right here, okay, which is this right here, had three sections. Each of them would be 10 feet in length, and that would be 10 feet from the door to the line where the lampstand and the table would be placed, okay? The, the displacement in from the door, okay? And that would be 10 feet, which is one-third of this total. Then there is another 10 feet from there to where the altar of incense was, and another 10 feet from there to the second veil, which would be the back of that holy place portion. That's shown here, okay? You have that first veil and the door of the first veil. You go 10 feet into here. You go another 10 feet, and this, this is showing the lampstand and the table of shoe bread. 
And then this shows the altar of incense, and so it would be 10 feet from the door to the lampstand and the table, 10 feet from the lampstand and table to the altar of incense, and 10 feet from the altar of incense to that second veil uh, where there would be the entrance into the most holy place. Okay? And the most holy place would then actually be simply 15 feet. Um, now, you would not have three vessels dividing it up, but again, there is a principle on how that's going to be divisible by three. Um, I'm not even sure I've got... It, did I have it written in there? All right, I thought I had omitted it. Okay, so I'll just let you go ahead and read it and keep me on track that way. The second veil is one-third of, the dis of these distances from the back of each 50 feet. Okay, so oh, this, is, each. this is the second veil right here, okay? It's right one here. Third, yep. This would be the entrance into the most holy place, and it is showing where you put that dividing line for the one-thirdness, so to speak, okay? So it would be one-third of the length from the very back of the court. Now, if the court's 150 feet, that would mean if you're going one-third of that distance to where the second veil is, how long would that be? 50 feet. That would be one-third of 150 is 50 feet. That would mean the second veil is 50 feet from that back Okay, and however, it would also, that would also make it so that it's how many feet from there to the gate? 100 feet, right? So we'll, all right, you go ahead and you do it. And we'll okay, the second veil is a third of these distances from the back of each. Mm -hmm. 50 feet from the back of the tabernacle. 50 feet from the back of the tabernacle. And 15 feet from the back of the Most Holy Place. And this second veil is 15 feet from the back of the Most Holy Place, the back wall of that inner room. Okay. The Go second ve veil, veil is 100 feet from the gate Wh or two-thirds length of the tabernacle. And that would make it 100 feet from the gate or two-thirds of the entire 150-foot length of the tabernacle. And it is 30 feet from the door or two-thirds of the length of the compartment. And this also would make this second veil 30 feet from the door, okay? So in other words, between the two veils would be a total of 30 feet, okay? 30 feet, the second veil is 30 feet from the door, or what? Or two-thirds of the length of the compartments. And that would make this two-thirds of the length of these compartments together, the entire sanctuary. Does that make sense? And this principle of two-thirds ends up becoming important too. I don't know that I have this listed in there. Might be there, I don't think it is. But if you look at this, there's also the width of the tabernacle. Do I have the width of the tabernacle written out in there? Okay, the width of the tabernacle is 75 feet. So its length is 150. The width is 75. This would be half of that, but if you put the whole thing together, this would be one-third of the total half of this tabernacle. Make sense? Okay, so this plus this, okay, this is 75, but this is the equivalent of two 75s. So that would be one section of 75. This would be the equivalent of two sections of 75 in principle. And so again, it's one, two, three. Does that make sense? And so this would be two-thirds of that total right there that we just looked at. Okay? And that, that's, a, that's a fee number, if you're familiar with that. Okay. All right, go ahead and read. The 30-foot length of, the, of holy place is trisected so that it has a distance of 10 feet from the second veil mm -hmm. to the altar of incense, mm -hmm. 10 feet from the table and the candlestick, mm -hmm. and 10 feet to the first veil or door. Okay, and we already showed that. Yeah. Good. Go ahead. The 69 feet 
of 70 feet length of the front court is trisected. Mm-hmm. 23 feet from the door to the laver. Mm-hmm. 23 feet to the altar of sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And 23 feet to the gate. And the 70, 70th, the sorry, the 70th is counted 70th, 70th yeah, right is counted by itself as the seventh day sabbath and the 70th <laughs> i can't say it week of daniel 9 24 through 27. okay so you have this w- one foot where the priest stood there was 69 feet leading up to him right so he is in the 70th foot right and that, as you can see, is counted all by itself because it's the 69 that we use to trisect equally to 23, right? But Yahweh always took the 7th, which includes the 70th, and put that distinct or separate by himself because, yeah, you're going to say something? It helps if I say it first and then it's read. Because it's numbers. Okay, okay. All right. I, all right. And I'll, I'll see what I can do about that. I, I may not remember all the order in which everything is listed, but we can go back and do it. Okay. So the seventh is all by itself. This is a principle to keep in mind. Okay. You've got six, which actually... <laughs> Six is going to be divided into two groups of three. It can also be considered, in some cases, three groups of two. But the seventh is going to be by itself. Okay. Now, um, let me give you the numbers of the steps in the tabernacle so you can visualize that. Okay. You have these steps one, two, and three in the court roundabout. These steps 4, 5, and 6 are in the holy place. Veil, holy place, and veil. Okay, And then step 7 is the most holy place all by itself. When Yahweh Elohim showed Moses the vision that he accounted as Genesis the first chapter, the seventh day was the Sabbath day, and that was all by itself. Okay? Now, it, right, it was the day of rest, and it was, it was to be, quote, sanctified and set apart, okay, from the other days. And so Yahweh worked six days and rested the seventh day, okay? Now, we'll get into it maybe later on in a little more detail, but I'll mention this. The first three days are one group of days. The second three days, days four, five, and six, are a second group of three days. And they're grouped together for specific reasons. We'll talk about it in a few minutes. The first three days, well, I'll mention it now. We'll come to it at some point. The first three days are before Yahweh Elohim showed the sun, moon, and stars in the creation. Okay? Again, this is the way he showed it in the vision. Moses is writing a vision. In Genesis first chapter, okay? I, I emphasize that because this gets completely confused and messes people up throughout the entire world. And then you have people arguing for centuries and centuries and centuries about why this couldn't have be, been created before the other. Yahweh didn't say he created this thing before something else, a day before or two days before something else. In reality, in reality, what Yahweh Elohim did was create all of it simultaneously or instantaneously in the realm of eternity. But what you have in Genesis, the first chapter, is a record of the way he showed Moses a movie or a vision of him creating after he had already created it. Okay? All right, we'll do veil colors in a couple of minutes. I want to cover some other things um, just because I think it's going to be necessary for people to visualize things too. All right, so these first three days are before the sun, the moon, and the stars. The sun, the moon, and the stars are Yahweh's official timekeepers. 
So in principle, days one, two, and three show the creation before time. And days four, five, and six show the creation in time. Okay? Now, why is that important? It goes back to the way Yahweh actually created everything in the realm of eternity. It's a representation of the fact that in the creative age, okay, Yahweh Elohim created the angels first, okay, and they're not created in a physical world. There is no physical sun, moon, and stars, or earth, or any of those things back here in the angelic creation. So they are created before time, okay, and before the sun, moon, and stars. The vegetation that's raised out of the earth is the only life form that is recorded in Moses' vision within those first three days. The vegetation is a symbol of the angels, while the animal life and human life is the symbol of the physical creatures, which came after the angels. Okay? Now, the angels, I'm, I'm kind of getting into another thing, but to me this is very important to understand. Otherwise, you start disconnecting principles from See, these things that we're dealing with are all symbols of spiritual principles. We need to understand what the spiritual principles are. The rest of this is simply the way Yahweh has symbolized it and encoded symbols. Okay? So, these life forms, the angels, were created before there was a physical creation. There was no earth, okay? no sun, no moon, no stars when they were created. Now, the angels' bodies are bodies made like Yahweh Elohim's great spirit embodiment, only in a lesser form. That's why Dr. Said, Dr. Kinley said that, doc, that Yahweh Elohim's body was super incorporeal or incorporeal, and the angels' bodies were incorporeal or incorporeal. And so, that just means that their spiritual bodies, they don't have flesh and blood, they don't have the physical material manifestation. Okay? But that which makes them function is light. Okay? Their energy is the energy of the light of Yahshua the Messiah, who is the light of the world. He is the true Son of Yahweh and the true light that was represented even in the beginning of the creation before the sun was shown there to give light. So they're not getting their light from the physical sun, they're getting their light from the sun of Yahweh. Okay? Now the sun, of, the sun in the sky is simply put into the physical creation to show a representation of the sun of Yahweh giving light and life to everything and as we know, the physical sun is what gives the energy, the light, and the life to everything on this, in this physical world, that we, in this earth that we're in. Okay? But the sun of Yahweh is the real light. So they got their light there. Now, where do plants get their energy from? Well, green plants get their energy directly from the sun. Directly from the sun. The angels got their light directly from Yahshua, okay? And since angel means messengers, and Yahweh used the angels to give messages to humankind all the way on up until he actually started giving the Holy Spirit as a permanent gift to man, those angels or messengers got their messages from Yahshua, and Yahshua sent them to mankind to give mankind a taste of the things that Yahweh Elohim was showing to the angels. Likewise, in the physical world, you have that symbolism of the plants. They capture the energy of the sun. They then draw the substance from the earth and create the, the plant bodies and fruit and everything, and Animals, including people, they get their nourishment from those plants. 
and green plants, which can include plants that are red and you know orange and purple and all those bright, beautiful colors, okay, um, that are there in order to capture light and energy from the sun. That's what those colors are there for, okay? They're those like the chlorophyll and so forth. That is there in order to capture the light energy of the sun for the plant and we end up getting that same light energy but we get it in the chemical form that comes from the plants when we eat it. So we get our nourishment from the plants. The plants got theirs directly from the sun. Okay. And that shows the angels got theirs directly from Yahshua. And then the physical creatures would get the messages, the angels, our messengers, from the, those in the angelic creation. All right, going back to the seven days of creation, the only life form in the first three days was plants. Okay? And the green plants are the ones we're focused on as getting their energy from the sun. But there are also plants that don't do photosynthesis. Okay? And those have uh, properties too, some of which are important. And there are other things involving with their roots and other stuff like that. All I'm going to say is this. There were angels that ended up not getting... <laughs> well, I'll put it like this. Uh, just as it, this is one part of the angels, okay? Again, it's a third part. Everything's divided into three. A one third part of the angels got cut off from the light of the sun, Yahshua the Messiah. Okay? And they were bound in chains of everlasting darkness. And you can almost think of them as these plants like mushrooms that are living in deep, dank, dark places, okay, and they don't have any, they, they, they just don't take in the light, they can't deal with that, and they don't have any value placed on that. It's a whole different thing. Anyway, all right, now, then there's day four, five, and six, and you have living creatures here, which include fish, fowl, and other beasts of the earth, including man, that are in life here, and that's after uh, the sun, moon, and stars, or it's within the physical creation. Now, day one corresponds with day five. Day two, uh, I said that wrong, back up. Day one corresponds with day four. Day two corresponds with day five. Day three corresponds with day six. So I'm going through all of that just to nail down one basic principle without trying to go into so much more detail. There are one, two groups of three plus the one, which is the seventh day. That's threefold. That's how you take seven in three parts. Seven is divided into three parts by taking the seventh all by itself and the remaining ones are divided into two groups of three or into three groups of two. The two groups of three are days one, two, and three as a group, day four, five, and six as a group, or if you see the comparisons, which we can go into, one and four is a group of, that's two, two and five is another group, and three and six is another group. So it's two threes or three twos, okay? This will be important in terms of numerology, and again, it shows you again, you have two threes, three twos, <laughs> in all these different things, but you're working with these base numbers. It's all one, two, three. Make sense? Okay, all right. Okay, go ahead. The veils have three colors. Now, even the veils, which are in between the compartments, there's actually three of these colored veils, but there are two of them that are dividing veils. There's a, a set of veils 
in between the most holy place and the holy place, and in, uh, in between the holy place and the court round about, the first veil here, first dividing veil, and second veil or second dividing veil here, which is depicted here. You see the blue, purple, and scarlet here. That would be the first dividing veil between the court round about and the holy place. The second dividing veil would be between the holy place and the most holy place. Okay? And they have three colors. Okay? Go ahead. The veils have three colors, blue, purple, and scarlet. And they are blue and purple and scarlet. Okay? Now, talk about those pretty colors. Okay. Blue is the higher energy color of the three. Okay. Um, or it's the, you might call it the higher frequency color. Okay. Um, because all your colors are based on the frequencies of the light. Is all that written in there? Okay, go ahead and read. <laughs> okay, the veils have three colors, blue, purple, and scarlet showing a transition from high to low frequencies, colors or from heaven blue of the sky to earth red blood in the earth. Right, which of course then Yahweh had represented in the, with this creation. You look at the sky, the color of the sky is blue. Now actually the reason the color of the sky is blue is because the light that shines through the atmosphere Okay, when it comes into the atmosphere surrounding the planet, it bends the light waves just enough to make it so that it comes out blue. Now you have like a prism effect, and you will have uh, 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 blue or um, um, the ultra ultra blue color. Uh, what do you call it? violet, which is an ultra blue color, an ultra violet color. Okay at the higher frequency end of the spectrum uh, when the light is bent into the visible part of the spectrum. Now actually the spectrum in a way has three sections. Um, sometimes we don't think about it this way. But there's the visible spectrum which is a small area of frequencies of all of the electromagnetic spectrum all the energy that comes from the sun. That visible light is only a small segment of the total. Then there is a segment that's higher frequency than the ultraviolet or blue, and it goes into the very, very high frequency radiation, okay, um, that is, like it includes the gamma waves and other kinds of things. I don't think we've got on... And and yeah, so you've got those very high frequency waves, okay, and very high energy. Then, uh, uh, lower frequency than the red, you have infrared and all those other very, very low frequency, lower energy waves. <coughs> so you have a section below visibility, a section in visibility, and a section above visibility. In the visible segment, you have those light colors divided, usually they try to divide them into seven colors, just like the seven days of creation. So uh, you talk about them usually as seven colors, and um, so that's here uh, in this section. The light that's bent, that you see the, what's visible in the sky ends up being blue for the most part, okay? Now, you know how you look sometimes on a body of water and the body of water will look blue? Do you know why that is? It's simply reflecting the sky. You are looking at a reflection of the sky. That's a spiritual principle. That's showing that the witnesses of Yahweh in the earth, and water is one of his three main witnesses, are reflections of the heavenly things. Okay, so anyway, um, okay, and you had something in there, yes? Yes. I see what's interesting is when you fly in a plane, 
You take mm-hmm. off from the ground, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden you're going higher. And you go, go if it's storming, you're going above through the clouds and up above it. And then the sun's yeah. there. Yeah. And then you can actually see the bowl of the Earth, which it's round, not mm. flat. <laughs> yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. I know. I know. People. Yeah. I know. Yeah. That's right. But that shows how we have to get beyond our limited perspective. Now we're standing here on the earth, right? We have to get into a position that goes beyond our limited perspective in order to see things the way Yahweh has them. You know, you're looking at it from Yahweh's point of view, so to speak. You're still not really getting there, but it's a principle. Yes, you're looking at it from a higher level. (laughs) You have to get it. Well, look at it. Where was Moses when he saw the vision? In the yeah, in the mountain, in the cloud, up high. Okay, Yahweh had him at a higher view. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Good point. Okay, so the veils are blue and purple and scarlet, coming down from the higher frequency, uh, representing heaven, like the blue, down to the earth. The red is the lower frequency. Blood is red in animals, right? But plants, they have blood that's blue and green and red and purple and so forth. Green is the actual more common color that we call, talk about green plants. Chlorophyll is plant blood. And the actual chemical structure of chlorophyll is almost identical to the chemical structure of red blood cells, okay, or, or the hemoglobin, I will call it, which is the chemical component that makes our red blood cells red. Okay? So it's just one molecule different. We have iron in our red blood, and they have, I think it's manganese, I believe, uh, manganese and magnesium, and there's a couple of other little details I don't remember. Anyway, but it's just like one little element different between chlorophyll and blood, and red blood, okay, the hemoglobin in red blood. So, all right, go ahead and read. The gate or entrance is 30 feet wide. Okay, this gate or entrance is 30 feet wide. That's here, that's here, that's 30 feet, okay? Yahshua entered his ministry at the age 30. Now, this is the entrance to the tabernacle. Okay, and Yahshua entered his ministry at the age of 30. Okay, I'm going to have to erase and write. Okay, all right, but we get this part, right? Whole thing is 150 feet long, divided by three. That gives you 50. That second veil is on that 50th foot from the back. And that makes it so the second veil is also 100 feet from the gate. Okay? This whole section here, the house, two-room house, sanctuary is 45 feet long. 15 feet is the most holy place. And then 30 feet is this holy place section right here. And together that's the 45 feet. This 30-foot section is divisible by three, so that what happens is you have one-third of three, which is 10 feet, from the first veil to where the altar and, I mean, where the table and the lampstand are, another 10 feet to where the altar of incense is, and another 10 feet from there to that second veil. Okay? And so you have now, This is 70 feet. The priest takes up the 70th foot. You've run into a lot why the 7th or 70th is all distinct, okay? Leaving 69 feet, divisible by 3, which is 23 feet. So 23 feet from the gate to the altar, 23 from the altar to the laver, 23 from the laver to where the priest stood before the door, okay? Is there, oh, okay, I thought you were showing me something. All right, and again, it's 
one, two, three, if you figure this length, here is a one length, and this is the equivalent of two lengths, and that's a total of three. All right, now this gate or the entrance is 30 feet, and Yahshua, okay, I'm going to erase and start writing again because we're now dealing with some other locations in the tabernacle. Thirty feet there, like the thirty years until Yahshua is in his ministry. Okay, <clears throat> we'll deal with that more later on with some other numbers. All right, so that's a thirty, right there. That's the entrance. Yahshua enters his ministry at thirty. Go ahead and read. The door was three feet wide, and the door here was three feet wide. So that's the second entrance. Okay? Like the three full years of his ministry. And that is the three full years of Yahshua's ministry, which makes a total of 33 in principle. Go ahead. It was nine feet tall by three feet wide. Now this door here was nine feet tall and three feet wide. And some people say, well, how do you get that? Because there's nothing in the Bible that tells you that it's that way. You get it from where you measure the length of the curtains and uh, the coverings that go. There's curtains and coverings that go over this whole two-room section here. Okay? That forms the roof and the sidewalls. Okay? And then this section in the front it says is doubled. In other words, it's folded back over. And so what happens is that it's actually, um, yeah, it's folded back, or it's folded to the side. I'm trying to remember exactly how they do this. But anyway, it's folded and you end up with the remaining section of nine feet, okay? So you have the door of nine feet Okay, tall and three feet wide. Okay, and I suppose the correlations are listed there. As the 930 years of Adam's life. And this compares to the 930 years of the life of Adam, and he is the first man that enters into this world. And we're dealing with the, the, the veils or the entrances to the tabernacle and the entrance to the holy place. Okay, so that's your 930. Okay, go ahead. The sacrifice was laid on the wood. Wait a minute. Sorry, I missed one. The blood of the sacrifice is placed around all 360 in, uh, inches of the altar sacrifice. Okay, so um, let me go back. If it's 30 feet, how many inches is that? Well, it's 30 times 12, which equals 360 inches. Right? Got that? Okay, so the perimeter of this altar is 360 inches, okay? Um, actually, I did, did we state in there that the altar is, I think, yeah, that's what I was just going to say. I don't think we stated it in there yet. It's, 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 it's true, and it's on the... Uh, the chart, it must be, in, I must have put it in the next paragraph. Okay, I, yeah, I need to obviously okay, the sacrifice, format this. The sacrifice is laid on the wood uh, on the grating in the center of the altar of sacrifice. Okay, so the sacrifice, folks, was laid on the wood, on the grating, and the sacrifice was placed in the center of this altar. Okay, mm -hmm. now it just so happens that the altar is. 30 feet around, okay? We haven't it. stated that yet, but that's in the tabernacle, and we'll show the dimensions of it, okay? Its four sides were seven and a half feet long. So each of the four sides of the altar is seven and a half feet. Now, let me take you through a calculation, okay? In the Bible, it says it's five cubits, okay, on a side. Altar is five cubits on each of the four sides. It's a square. Okay? 
A cubit is how many feet? 1.5 or 1.5 feet, right? And so that equals 7.5 feet on each of the sides, correct? How many sides are there? So you multiply that by four sides and you get a total of 30 feet. Does <clears throat> that help? There's another thing to know about seven and a half feet. Okay, let's convert seven and a half feet to inches. We'll deal with this in, in a few minutes. I just want you to be aware of this. Seven and a half feet times 12 inches per foot is going to equal how many? It's, 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 it's 90. So it's 90 inches on each side, which is the same as seven and a half feet, which is the same as five cubits. Okay? 90 on the, the north, okay, south, east, and west side, okay, of the altar, okay? So the perimeter is a total of 360 inches, right? Or 30 feet, right? Or 20 cubits. Okay? Yeah. So there you go. All right. Now, all right, so we'll come back to this. 90 inches on the side, and if we want to complete the whole thing, then there's how many sides? Four sides. And that ends up equaling 360 inches. It's supposed to be two slashes. Got that? Okay. Now these, this is the altar of sacrifice. Okay. And these numbers are important and symbolic of certain things the way Yahweh has made the creation by the pattern. All right. Please read on. Around, uh, so it was 30 feet around the perimeter showing that Yahshua was around 30 years old before his, before his ministry. His center is three and three quarter feet from side, showing that Yahshua was laid on the wood on the cross three and three quarter years into his ministry. Okay, now, if the altar is seven and a half feet on a side, the center of the altar would be half that distance in from the side. And the sacrifice is laid on this, in the center, right? So that's seven and a half feet divided by two, and you get three, and we can say 0.75 or three and three quarters, okay? And Yahshua was around in this world for 30 years, going, like going around the perimeter of the altar in principle, okay? And then he went into his ministry at 30, and then he's going to the cross in, from the time of his ministry into the, where he's on the cross is about three, we say sometimes three and a half, but it's actually closer to three and three quarters years. Because if he was born in June, okay, and he was crucified in April, okay, then, what's that? Yes, and it was actually, oh, I see, yes, okay, yes. So it was a 53 days from the date that Yahshua was crucified, yes, until the, the, the date which would have been his 34th birthday. Yes, right. So what you've got is about two and a half months, give or take, okay, um, that he was short of his 34th birthday when he was crucified. That, you understand what I'm saying? And then Adam is 70, year, or I mean 70 years short of a thousand years, which is a day with Yahweh. Right, okay. So, and I'm going back here to the three and three quarters. So, 
If you have three quarters of a year, okay, how many months is that? Okay, that's nine months, right? Make sense? Okay, so that's like three years and nine months. And so if Yahshua is two plus months, okay, short or approximately that, short of his, of his birth date here at the crucifixion, okay, then you're down to about three years and ten months or three years and nine months, roughly, um, as shown here by the way the tabernacle is, okay, the dimensions in the tabernacle. All right, go ahead and read. Boy, we're almost at nine o'clock. Yeah. Woo! We ain't got it started yet. Okay, go ahead. The laver is 46 feet from the gate. 46 feet times 12 uh, inches per foot times step three equals 1656, which is the year of the flood. Okay, we've dealt with the altar a little bit and showed a little bit about how that is showing you something about Yahshua the Messiah. Okay, we haven't finished everything with the altar. I'm going to mention a couple more things about the altar. Obviously, we're probably not written there in that section. <clears throat> yeah, we ain't got there yet. That's a whole different thing. All right. So if the altar is 90 inches on a side, and the whole thing is a square. You have four sides of 90 inches, right? And I'm going to show it up here. <clears throat> okay. So you go around the altar, if you walk it, it's 360 inches, 30 feet, right? But it's also four sides of 90 inches. So it's four 90s. Now, this kind of representation is where people like me go freaking crazy. Because I was trained as a scientist and a mathematician. And now what I'm doing is using correlation of precepts, okay, rather than analytical calculations, and you're still doing calculations, but you're, 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 you're doing, we're taught to do analysis of things in, in scientific ways, right? And you never change in a single calculation, you don't change your units of measure, okay? But here, we're changing units of measure because what we're dealing with is not the physical measurement, it's the principle that's involved. Yes, yes, yes. Yahweh knows how to encode things the way we would measure them and in ways that are beyond our ways of measurement. And just to show you that he means it, he gives you two witnesses. All right, so... You have four sides of 90 inches, right? The principle here is 490. But you also have four corners on the altar, don't you? Right? And what is the number of degrees of that right angle on the corners? That's 90 degrees. So you can have 90 inches or 90 degrees, and you got four 90s. Either way, to, do you understand what I'm saying? Now, that is 490 in principle when you go around the entire earth in a 360 inch or 360 degree circle, right? Or in divine numerology, or actually in, in prophetic calculations, Yahweh used a year as 360 days in a year. So now you can start using inches, degrees, other things to show days. 
Now, can you see in principle how you can start mixing your system of units if you're looking at the principle? The principle here is the 360, but the 360 is shown whether it's inches, degrees, or days. Now, a scientist would never even think about that. You understand what I'm saying? But Yahweh knows how to encode all this stuff so that he leaves us without an excuse. And we have to bow and go, hey, boss, you're smarter than I am. Okay? Now, this is what will really freak you out. 360, in principle, is 490. Because, again, it's 490s. Right? Now, when Yahweh uses times, he calculates things as 490 year cycles, which in principle comes right on back to 77s. So in principle, all of this ends up being seven. I like that. Yeah. So now you've seen the number three, the number one, the number two, the number seven, right? All those prime numbers in there. You also have a number five, but five is a little different because it's abstraction. And you have that in there. So anyway, let me go into this. So the priest would go in and do services around this altar, putting sacrifices on this altar how many times a day? So there were two sacrifices, two times of sacrifice. It's called the morning sacrifice, the evening sacrifice. Okay, And so there would be two per day. Right? So when I have this 490 in principle which is also 360, and the priest is going to do this twice a day, 490 twice is how many? 980. Right? So, that's if he does this two per day, then he's going around there and he's doing it 90 per day. 980 per day. Thank you. I'm sorry. Right? Right? So this is in one day. Going around the altar. Make sense? Okay. Now, Yahweh said, a day with him is as what? A thousand years. And a thousand years is as one day. So let me ask you a question. Doesn't 980 fit in to a thousand years? with not enough room left over to get another cycle in. Does that make sense? You got that? So, when the priest goes around this altar every day, it's like going through two cycles of 490. Okay, let me just show you on this timeline. We'll take all that, and now we'll stretch it out on a line, linearly. How many cycles were there with Adam? Two cycles, and it came out to 980 in principle. Adam was 50 short of the 980 because Adam could not live to Pentecost or till the Holy Spirit was given in principle, right? When Yahshua raised, he raised from the dead the moment, Yahshua, or the moment Adam died in principle. And it was 50 more days from the time Yahshua raised until the Holy Spirit was poured out. Right? And so, Yahshua made up the 50 years that Adam fell short and brought Adam over to the 980 in principle. Okay? So, you have a thousand years and you have 980 in a thousand years in principle. It's not here on this chart because we don't have room to put it on the chart. But there's actually two 490-year segments with Noah. 
you see one of them written here. Noah was given the vision 120 years before the flood, and he was allowed to preach for 120 years. Then he was in the ark, and there was a 370 days, or a year and 10 days, okay, um, until they came out of the ark, and the 100 plus the 370 is 490, right? But the one that's not written there is the fact I wish this thing would quit moving back. Noah is the tenth generation in the genealogies. And how old was Noah when Yahweh Elohim gave him that vision? 480 years. And so the 10 plus the 480 is a second 490 with Noah. Okay? Okay. Noah is the tenth. He is generation ten, the tenth generation. And Noah is 480 years old when Yahweh gave him the vision. And so the ten plus the 480 is 490. So you got two 490s with Adam, you got two 490s with Noah. Okay? And you'll have two 490s in each 1,000 year period in principle, because as we just calculated, that if you do two of these, you get 980, and 980 is within the 1,000. Okay? Uh, okay, boy, we're... Man, I thought we would get through a lot more than this. All right, go ahead... Um, Read what you got. We didn't even really talk about the labor yet, did we? You mentioned it. Okay. So let me go. So it's 23. Uh, um, the labor here. All right. So it's 23 feet from the gate to the altar. Well, wait a minute. Let me just go back to where you're at. Okay. And I'll do. Go ahead. Just go ahead and read where you're the at. The labor is 46 it. feet from the gate. Right. 46 times 12 inches per foot times 3 equals 1656. Right. Now, so it's 23 feet from the gate to the altar plus 23 more to the laver, which is 46 feet. Right? There's 12 inches in a foot, so 46 feet times 12 inches per foot is 1656. 552 and the laver is the third step. It's step three. You see that? Okay. And that gives you 1656. Which is the year of the flood. And that is the year of the flood. 1656 years from the beginning of time. Okay. All right. Where are we at? Joshua. This is, you got half that paragraph to go. All right, we'll go ahead and read what you got, because I know we're not going to okay. get through everything anyway. Joshua was baptized in water to begin his ministry when Herod's temple was 46 years in the building, and Joshua said he would raise the true temple or his body in three more days. These three days ended 490 years or seven, seven, 77 or Sabbaths, and Herod's temple was 49 years old. 46 plus 3 is 49. See John Two, 19 through 21. Okay, which is a lot of words. So let me show you. Joshua went into his ministry, and he's approximately 30 years old, right? He has to be baptized in water at the beginning of his ministry to fulfill the priest being washed in water from the laver when he began his ministry. So Joshua's at the age of 30. My goodness, I can't. Goodness gracious. The hurrier I go. All right. So at the age of 30, he goes into his ministry. What happened was that when he went into his ministry, Herod's temple had been, been being worked on. It had been in the building for 46 year, or for 16 years. And so that meant that Herod's temple, which is only 
a physical type and shadow of the true temple, which is the body of Yahshua, the temple was 46 years old, right? And that was when Yahshua was baptized at age 30. And, and of course, the baptism is in water. So, baptism in water would be symbolized here at the laver. Do you see the three here? Do you see the circular configuration of the laver? That's 30. But it's also 46 feet from the gate. So 30 is 46. <laughs> and when Yahshua was baptized, the temple, the physical temple, has 46 years in the building. Okay? And do you see where that corresponds to where he's at at the labor? Now, Yahshua was in his ministry for a full three years. Okay? Three, and we already went through it. Three and a half or three and three quarters years. Okay? And so, that gives you a total of 49 years, which equals seven sevens. Okay? Which is, um, okay, that's a, a week. Yeah, I know. I haven't gotten there yet. Right. Well, there's that. But what you, what you have is, this is a small segment of time in a much larger segment of time, which is called, and I'm not going to get a chance to finish this tonight. We started out, we talked about 490-year cycles, right? But there is one specific 490-year cycle that's prophesied about in the book of Daniel, and that's 457 years from the order to rebuild the, the walls of the city of Jerusalem, and it goes unto the Messiah, and the Messiah in the last week okay, uh, fulfills everything needed, and brings, and there's six things in the prophecy, and Yahshua the Messiah on the day of Pentecost has fulfilled 490 years. And that would be here. So he's gone 49 years. And then you have him. Well, I don't know how to do this quickly and easily. But anyway, you've got the one that's added and you get to the 50th year because what happens is um, in the year that the Holy Spirit is poured out, the temple has been 50 years from the time the foundation was laid. This 50th year was a jubilee year. And the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day called the day of Pentecost. Both Pentecost and Jubilee, that's an L and an EE, -E, sorry. Both of them are 50s. One is the 50th year, the other is the 50th day from a prior event, okay? All right, and you're also going to have the 490 years fulfilled, and we're over time. I obviously don't have time to complete all the details and even make it sound rational so <laughs> because I thought we'd get through a lot more than this but I hope that's of some value I hope it shows you a little bit about the fact that Yahweh's got his purpose encoded in this tabernacle pattern okay which is the main message of the whole thing okay you get this tabernacle and you, you try to understand it it empowers you. It can help you to really understand Yahweh and his purpose. So I hope this has at least been some encouragement for that. Praise Yahshua. Thank you, Dr. Welsh. That brings us close to our class for this evening. Hope everybody enjoyed that. Announcements are as follows. Classes are held every Wednesday and Friday from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. and Sundays 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Our after class question and answer period is the third Friday of each month. For January, it will be the 19th.
Members and ministers, we ask that you come to class, be on time, and dress appropriately so that you may be called as speakers. That concludes our announcements. Let's rise for the doxology so that we may be dismissed. I will be quoting the last two verses of the book of Jude from the Holy Name Bible. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah.